Greetings once again in that name that is above every name for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. How blessed we are. How wonderful it is to be in the house of the Lord one more time on this wonderful Lord's Day and God knows just exactly what he's doing. Amen. Sent the rain right on time. Amen. Turned the grass green and cleared the air so we could make it out to worship this morning. How blessed we are and how wonderful it is. Amen. In the, in, in the words of the cultural, God is still good. Amen. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't serve a God like this, who made the air so crispy? I just don't see how anyone could stay away from church and try and worship at home unless they had to. Amen. As long as you got the Amen. The ability and the uh, amen, fortitude and the energy to get up. Amen. Uh, what a blessing it is. And, uh, and there are, you know what the psalmist says. He couldn't describe how beautiful it was. So he said, he says, he asked the question, how good and how pleasant it is. For brethren to dwell together in unity and kinfolk to dwell together in unity. Those who are united in the faith, how they dwell together in unity. He said, it's so good, it's like, I can't really describe it. And so it's like the precious ointment upon the beard. Not, not, not just any priestly beard, but Aaron's beard. Yeah. Amen. The high priest. The one that went into the Holy of Holies at least once a year, not the regular priest. He said it's like the precious ointment, the special oil, because you know the high priest he got the special oil. He didn't get the regular oil. He didn't. He didn't get the olive oil, but he got the special oil. Amen. 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 And he said it is like the precious ointment upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. And then what happened? He said when we come together like that, life happens, even life forevermore. Amen. Amen. And amen. God is still good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And so we greet you in his name that is above every name. And so, amen. We are delighted to have all of those persons on board with us today. Amen. Brother Lamont Dante Jackson is on board. Amen. Sister Olivia McMillan is on board all the way from Baltimore, Maryland. Amen. Sister Barbara Cherry is on board. Sister Gwendolyn McDonald is on board all the way from Buffalo, New York. Amen. The brother Harry, Deacon Harry Richardson is on board. Sister Paulette Wilson is on board all the way from Southwest Philadelphia. Amen. Sister Nita, Nita J. Green is on board all the way from, amen, um, yeah, wherever that place she lives at. Amen. Sister Betty Trimble is on board all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. Sister Keita Blackwell is on board all the way from Felton, Delaware. Amen. Sister Adrian, you know where that is? Amen. God bless you. Deacon Daniel J. Johnson is on board. Sister Sheila Adams is on board. Sister Cher... Haley is on board, amen. Sister Pamela Saunders is on board all the way from, all the way from Glenside, Pennsylvania, amen. Sister, Brother David, you know where that is? Amen. God bless you. Deacon Leroy Hagler Jr. is on board. He must be out of town, amen. Amen. Uh, Deacon Wilbert Moore is on board all the way from, 
amen, in person today. Amen. Sister Tiffany D. Curtis is on board all the way from, amen, in person today. Sister Ray Cook is on board. We're delighted to have you all the way from New Jersey. Amen. All right. Brother June Coe is on board. Sister Angela Davis is on board as she make her way into the sanctuary. Amen. Sister Dion Hyatt is on board all the way from Smyrna, Delaware. Well, amen, amen, and amen. We are delighted to have all of those persons on board who are sharing with us today what a blessing it is and what a blessed day it is. And we look forward to worship the Lord in a mighty way. Amen. Let us stand at this time. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. All right, our congregational hymn as we sang with uplifted voices.
verses 20, 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faith, faithless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Most holy and eternal God, our Father, Lord, we come again to say thank you. Thank you, God, for watching over us all night long. Touch us this morning with a finger of love and start us on another day's journey. And even us to see a day that we've never seen before and we'll never see again. We thank you because you're God and you're God all by yourself. We come this morning, oh God, to just welcome you into this service. Come in, oh Lord, and just have your way from the front to the rear. We bless your name this morning. We glorify you. We give you all the honor and the glory because you deserve. God, continue to walk with us and talk with us. Lead us and guide us in the way that you would have us to go. And Lord, we will continue to give your name praise, not just this day, but all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we do pray with thanksgiving. Let everyone say amen. amen.
Amen. Good morning, Second Mount Zion. Good morning, Second Mount Zion. We welcome you to today's installation of the Sunday School lesson. Uh, today's lesson will be taken from the gospel as accorded by Matthew. We will look at the 12th chapter, and we will look at verses 22 through 32, with our key verse being 28. And our, our uh, subject is a demonstration of power. Amen. Amen. And as we get to that, just some brief announcements. As always, we ask that you would send your mail correspondence, specifically your tides, to Second Mount Zion's P.O. Box, which is P.O. Box 41839, Philadelphia, PA 19101. Uh, we ask that for those of you who are in person that you would refrain from eating or drinking in the sanctuary. If you have to, please excuse yourself, go into the lobby and follow directions of our ushers. We also ask that if you or any member of your family takes ill, that you would please contact the church, leave a voice message so that we can have confirmed knowledge. Also today, immediately following service, we will be going to the uh, Love Zion Baptist Church, which is at 2521 North 23rd Street. So immediately following service, we will go over there and fellowship with them as Pastor Moore will be preaching for them. Amen. Also, we want to remind you that this is a special week. Amen. On Tuesday, July 11th, will be the birthday of Pastor James Moore Sr. Amen. Yeah, y'all can, can show your appreciation now. And then y'all can show y'all appreciation a little later. Amen. Amen. There is a drop down box for those of you who use Easy Tides that if you want to give, you can give to Pastor Moore's birthday to acknowledge him in such fashion. Amen. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to get to the lesson and I want to introduce uh, this quarter's lesson. Um, and just to remind you that this quarter we have been talking about the righteous reign of God. Uh, for the last five weeks and starting in June, we looked at it from the view of the uh, prophets, 
both major and minor. Now, today, we're going to shift to unit two, which will talk about how Jesus envisions the kingdom. And we will look at that from the scope of the gospel, Matthew. So this, this, this unit will present four units on Jesus' kingdom teaching, which will be found in Matthew. Today's lesson will recount how Jesus' powerful acts of deliverance are evidence of God's kingdom that is in our midst, or heaven ruling over earth. So we want to keep in mind that today we start a new lesson, and today I will introduce that lesson, and then we will continue to look at that as we go on uh, through the next uh, four weeks looking at Matthew. So Matthew, Matthew, we know that Matthew is one of the original 12 of the apostles who was called by Jesus. Um, he was called from his vocation as a tax collector. Now stick a pin in that when you think about that, that Jesus calls Matthew or Levi, who was a tax collector, and at that time, tax collectors were considered the evil of society, amen, because they squeezed people and they extorted the money for the government as well as themselves. So they were the, considered the lowest of society, but look who Jesus calls, the unexpected, and we will see that unfold even in, this, in today's lesson on whom Jesus ministers to. Everybody that you say your enemy is not your enemy. Because sometimes we have a we we have a way of making enemies uh, just because, you know, just because that person don't like them don't mean that you don't like them. Sometimes we don't even give a chance, folk, the chance to to do something for us not to like them. We just don't like them right off the bat. Thank God Jesus doesn't do that. Because some of y'all, yeah, y'all be in trouble. Amen. Amen. So we know that Matthew, he was called, he was a tax collector, he was called by Jesus, and he left everything to follow Jesus. We know that in Matthew's gospel, he wrote primarily to a Jewish audience. Amen. And so that, that is the perspective that we write. And when we come to this, when we look at, even when we look at this 12th chapter of the gospel of Matthew, it's going to be filled with a lot of defense when he writes in this 12th chapter because uh, the Pharisees always were trying to catch him in something. They were trying to build this case against him because they didn't want to accept that he was Messiah because it would kind of knock their power. It would knock them. So they didn't want to accept it. So when you look at this, they always tried to catch Jesus because his fame and reputation was growing. And why was it growing? Because he was doing his ministry and his ministry was about healing and helping the poor and, and people were following. He was gaining this following and this reputation. And let me say, when you're successful, everybody ain't going to like it. There's some people who are not going to like it. Everybody won't, won't be happy about your success. But it's how you handle it, and we can learn from Jesus how he handles opposition. And so in this 12th chapter, it's filled with Jesus defending Messiahship because they will, he will, they will try to trip him up and bring somebody on the Sabbath, and he heals them, and, 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 and then they will say, aha, we got you. Or they will say, I see your disciple, I see your apostles. Why are they eating or why are they gleaning on the Sabbath? Aha, we got you. Gotcha. you. But Jesus refutes this. <laughs> and can you refute, can you defend yourself as a Christian? Well, Do you have a defense as a Christian? Uh, it's quiet, it's quiet, it's all right. But, but, but maybe we'll try to help you out. Maybe we'll try to help you out because Jesus will defend Messiahship. So when we look at this, let's put a framework around this. The situation is that we will see is Jesus' power over Satan. The complication or the tension in the text we will see is blaspheming or what they did was attributed Jesus' power to Satan. Misappropriation of power. Our solution is believe in Jesus' power and authority. And if I wanted to aim at something, I would say stand with Jesus. 
because we will learn from this lesson that if you ain't standing with Jesus, you are against Jesus. There is no gray area, Christians. Either you with him or you against him. And as we would say, is you with me? Amen. Who you with? Who you with? Amen. We'll answer that question. So we start out this lesson, and here it is again that they try to trip him up or they try to, they try to uh, get him. And here we find that they bring to him one that is possessed with the devil. They then was brought to him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. This man had some problems. Not only was he demon-possessed, but he couldn't see, and he couldn't hear. And it says, and he healed him in so much as the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. First thing we notice is that he was brought. Somebody thought enough to him to get him to Jesus. There's some folk who are blind and, and turn a deaf ear to what Jesus says, but it takes someone to bring him. Yes, sir. We need to bring some people to church. We need to get someone to Jesus and then let Jesus do the healing. See, we try to do it all. Just get them here and then let, yeah, we try to do everything. We try to bring them, heal them, pray for them. No, your job is to get them here and let Jesus do his job. Amen. And so once he was brought, but look who Jesus, I told you, Jesus called Matthew, who called Levi, who was uh, the worst of society at this point. Jesus heals a man who is, who is his adversary. He was demon possessed. He had demons. He was acting counter to Jesus, but Jesus still had compassion on a man to, to not only exercise the demon, but also heal his infirmities. Jesus can do anything to anyone. No one is exempt from this. Well, we'll push that. We'll talk about that exemption point. And so look who Jesus heals, a demon possessed man. And so when he does this, and as we, we should note that his target audience were Jews and the Jews always required a sign. Signs and miracles were to do what? to point to Jesus. These were all to say that this must be because he has some extra. We see him do some things that ain't nobody, ain't nobody do. Has Jesus done something for you that, ain't no, that nobody could do? Did he get you out of the situation? Then you know that that's proof that there is a God, that Jesus is, that, that the kingdom is here. And so when this happened, people were amazed and said with hope, is this not the son of David? which is another way of saying, is this not Messiah? They look with hope like, oh my God, this must be Messiah. But I just told you that everybody ain't happy about your success. Because the religious folk or the Pharisees, when they say it says, they start hating. And they said, nah, he does that by the power of Beelzebub or Satan. You know, it's like when you win too much, they say you must be cheating. Because it can't possibly, you can't possibly win that much. Must be cheating. In the case of New England Patriots, that's true. You, they did cheat. But then some people say you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. But I digress. <laughs> But, but in this case, some the people were amazed. The Pharisees says, nah, because they didn't want to ascribe that much power to that man, which means that, that they would have to take a back seat. He couldn't be that powerful. And the only way to, because to, they have been trying to knock him all the way. So in order to refute him, in order to, to, uh, to dissuade folk, they said, no, he does that by the power of Beelzebub or the prince of the devils that basically saying he's a demon. But notice that when they said that, they even put him lower than the demon. They put the demon higher than him that he must be one of them or lower than, lower than Satan. 
So Jesus, what he does is he will refute this with a few arguments. So we see that in this 12th chapter, this is the fourth defense of, of Jesus as Messiah. In this defense, he will defend uh, the Messiah is God's kingdom. And so first we see proof of his messianic power. When he healed the demon-possessed man, the man who was blind and deaf, he healed them. We see proof of his power. We see reaction to that in that some people believe, some people hate it. The people believe. Could this be the son of David? Is this Messiah right in front of us? Sometimes Jesus is right in front of us and we miss him. Because we don't understand because we want Messiah to be something else. And the reason the Pharisees said it because he can't be Messiah. But all along he had been preaching a ministry that the kingdom, of, the kingdom is at hand. Repent now for the kingdom is at hand is what he says in chapter 4. And so now we see the four counterclaims, and this will be the balance of our lesson, against the Pharisees. The first counterclaim, he says, because Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, the first point, every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation. Every city or house divided itself cannot stand. That's country sense, but let me, let me see if I can explain it further when he talks about a divided house he's saying and he makes this point he says if I am of Satan and I drive out Satan and this is what I have been doing and people have been following me and this is all I have been doing how can I be because that means that I'm working I would be working against myself to defeat myself if I'm driving out Satan, if I'm defeating Satan, if I'm delivering folk and folk are getting saved and folk are getting delivered from the demon or being delivered from Satan, and then they come and now they're in their right mind and now they're able to tell people about what I do, how can I be Satan? To me, it makes country sense. So he's saying a house divided cannot stand. If I was, if I was working for Satan, then I wouldn't be doing that. So he makes four logical refutes of this. A house divided cannot stand. A church divided cannot stand. Eventually, it will fall. That's why we have a mission statement. That's why we get together, because we should be on one accord. We should listen to Jesus. A house divided, a church divided, a second Mount Zion divided cannot stand. We need to be doing the same thing. Jesus' mission was to heal folk, to reach out to the disenfranchised. We should be on the same page. And so he says, first evidence of that is that a divided, or if your allegiance is divided, it can't stand. Can't say you're a Christian on Sunday and then on Monday you act a different way can't stand. That's divided allegiance. That's the first, the first, because he knew him. He said it can't stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, is he divided against himself? How shall this kingdom stand? If I'm driving out Satan, how can this stand? That don't make no sense. And he says, and if by bells above, well, if by devil, I cast out devils, by whom do your children cast out, and therefore they shall be your judges? What he's saying is that there were some folks, and if you go to that 19th chapter of uh, Acts, around verse 13, read to 16, you'll see this, the story of the sons of Siva, who were uh, uh, some priests, and they were exorcists, and they were itinerant, right? Yeah. And there were folks in that day who would cast out demons, but in this case, these sons of Siva, they tried to do it in the name of Jesus. And the demon looked at them and says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but you I don't know. And the demons turned against the folk that was trying to drive them out. So he said, if therefore, if you, if you say that these folks did it and you give them credit, how can you not give me credit when you see my works and they are consistent? How can you say, they did it by Jesus or by God, and he does it by the devil. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
He says, be careful because them folks will turn on you. They will turn around and judge you as in with the sons of Siva in Acts. That's Acts chapter 19. That's your homework. You can go read that 13 through 16. I'm not going to read it in the interest of time. And so a house divided cannot stand. So denying him is, elo- is, is not logical. It's not logical. He says, but if I, and here, here's where we hang our hat, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Messiah has truly come. Because you see my works, you see... Do you know that, God, that there is a heaven reigning over earth? Have you seen the evidence of what God has done? Some of y'all has have to seen it. Some of y'all seen it this week. God had to do something. God, he brought you here today. He woke you up. That's evidence enough that God is still, God is present among us, that the kingdom is among us. He makes another point, and he talks about the strong man. How else can one enter in a strong man's house, spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man or tie him up? Then he takes his goods. Jesus is saying, Satan is the strong man, and I am the one who comes in, and I will bound Satan. Then I could, because what does Satan want? Satan wants to come to rob, steal, kill, and he takes folks hostage and he makes them believe things. But here Jesus is freeing people from the powers of Satan. But first he, but first he must bound Satan, defeat Satan. And we could say he defeated him when he tempted him. When Satan tempted Jesus before, before this he tempted him and Jesus passed the test with flying colors, right? And then he looks out, because we talked last week about the future second coming or millennial coming when he will be bound to the lake of fire. Amen? So he's saying that Satan is the, Satan is the strong man. I have already defeated him. I defeated him when he tried to tempt me. I will further defeat him when I go to the cross and die and take the sting out of death. He will be defeated. And sometimes we're fighting fights that we don't have to fight anymore because they have been won. Y'all get that later. You fighting against something, you blame it on Satan, you blame it on the devil. Mm Mm-mm. The devil, you give the devil, sometimes we give the devil too much credit. And when you give someone too much credit, maybe you give them more power. You know, sometimes when, you know, when you have an issue, and the issue starts to die out, yeah. and then you start to talk about it again, yes, and now it comes back to life, and you breathe life into, we breathe life into the wrong things. Yeah. And here, here Jesus is, is saying that I have, def- I have defeated, I have tied up Satan and took his spoils, because his spoils were those that he tricked into, not, into, into them believing, those ones who were bound by Satan, that he is delivering from sin. He gets them back. That's what Jesus does. And there's some folk that he's, that he's getting back. So we don't need to give him credit. So he makes the case of the strong man. But then he talks about neutrality. Some folk who sit, and you, you know, especially for a man, if you straddle the fence, boy, oh boy, if you fall on that fence, you're going to be in trouble. There is no neutrality. He said, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not me scatters abroad. Who you with? There is no middle ground. Either you with Jesus or you're not. You can't abstain. There's no such thing as abstaining. Because your abstinence shows your position. Let me make this plain. We had, an, we had an election some years back, and maybe you didn't like one or both of the candidates, and a lot of people says, well, I ain't gonna vote. They abstained. And then someone got in there that they did not like. And you know what I said? Your non-vote was a vote for that person because you abstained. 
And that shows your position. Is you with him or you're not? Because if you're not with him, and he says, if you're not with me, then you're not helping me. You're working against me. Because he says either if you're gathering, he says you're gathering or you're scattering. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters. So if you're not with Jesus, you're working against Jesus. You're working counter. Who you with? You can't sit neutral. You can't just say, oh, I don't, do, I, don't, I don't hurt nobody. Don't nobody hurt me. I'm going about my business. Now, Jesus looks at neutrality as, as opposition. But then he gets into an interesting point. He says, whoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven, neither in this world or the world to come. You can talk about Jesus. And we see this Saul of Tarsus who was a staunch opposition to Christianity, who sought to oppress folk because they were those of the way, those who were Christian, those who were Christ-like. So he he opposed Jesus. But ain't God something that he still will give you an opportunity even when you turn your back? You know, some folk, we turn our back on God. We turn up, we say, God ain't listening. I can't take it. You feel like it's too much. And you, feel that he, you say, he ain't listening to me. I'm done with that. I'm done with Jesus. He says, I'll give you another chance, even though you talked about me. <laughs> even though you was mean. Even though you said some things about me. Yeah, yeah. I won't take it personal. But what he does take personal and here's a warning to the Pharisees, because he says, you want a slippery slope. What he does take personal, he says that if you talk about or blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, that is unforgiven. Why? Because the, cause you re- really, you're denying everybody. Because it's the Holy Ghost who does the work of Jesus. It's the Holy Ghost who convinces, who converts. It's the Holy, and if you deny the works of the Holy Ghost, you deny God. And he says, let's see, the Holy Ghost is, 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 is the last train or the last bus. And you, you may talk about Jesus and you might miss that bus. You might talk about God and you might miss that bus. But then there's one more bus you got one more, and then after that bus, ain't no more buses. Or let me say this, the bus might be going another way. <laughs> those, th- those three buses, Chris, are going north. North. Now, there might be one that might be going southbound. <laughs> Those are three of them. He says, you might miss the first one. You, you, you might talk about God. You might miss that one. And you might talk about Jesus, and you might miss that one. But if you talk about the Holy Ghost, and you blaspheme against that one, that's it. The only one that's coming is going the other way, and you don't want that train. You don't want that bus. Yeah, hmm. You don't want that one. And so, and so he, he, he gives a warning to them that you are on a slippery slope. Either you're with him or you're against him. Either you're working with Jesus, with Jesus or you're working against him. Who are you with? Who are you with? That's the question of the day. But Jesus makes these refutable arguments that yes, not only am I Messiah, but the kingdom is right here. I know sometimes it don't look like it, but the kingdom is here. We will continue to discuss this discussion next week. Amen. Thank you. That's all I got.
Amen. What a, what, a, what, a, what a challenging lesson. Amen. What a challenging lesson. Amen. And the uh, young people's class is back and they are ready to go. Uh, but let me just say, uh, thank you, Deacon Simpson, for our exposition of our Sunday school lesson. And uh, we can't be so hard on the Pharisees because we attribute a lot of stuff to a lot of people and a lot of things other than Jesus. You know, we go to the soothsayers and, you know, they gave us a number and we, we contributed to them. And uh, we go to Madam Somebody and Mr. C anybody and we contribute our healing to them. We read our horoscopes and, and we contribute it to, uh, let's see, since this month is the cancer, oh yeah, I read my horoscope today, I'm gonna be blessed. I'm gonna run into a beautiful blonde. And, and you, you start, and, and you start believing that stuff. I listened to Prophet Somebody on the TV, and he told me that uh, I was going to get a million dollars, a thousand dollars, and you go out looking for it, getting in the number line. We contribute a whole lot of stuff to other folk other than Jesus, and, and we have to be careful. You know, do they still have the Dear Abby section in the newspaper? Oh, oh, so they have, they have another something else similar, and we read, up, we read all of that stuff and we contribute it to somebody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Our young people are going to come now, and after our young people, and after we get another selection, amen, one of our very own uh, minister, Chris Dixon, is going to come and proclaim the word of God. Let the church say Amen. <laughs> Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's title is Power Over Evil. Point one, the power of a shared testimony. Anybody who's without Jesus, they have Satan with them. Don't be afraid to share testimony and share it boldly. God has the ultimate power. Point two, don't deny the power of the Holy Spirit. Your rejecting of God himself is fatal if you want to be accepted into heaven. There is no middle ground, either for him, either you're for him or against him.
Lord, right now we thank you. We thank you for another opportunity to be in the land of the living. We thank you for another opportunity for us to see your grace and get it right. Father, right now we pray that you give us knowledge and wisdom right now. Knowledge enough that we may have wisdom referred back to your word in Jeremiah. And let your word be in our mouth so that your children may hear from heaven and live thereby. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Second Mount Zion. We greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank God our Father for this opportunity to stand before you this morning. And if you can turn your Bibles with us this morning to the little bitty book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation, one chapter. We thank Sister Preston for reading a portion for us this morning. And we just want to look at verses 21 through 25. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And this morning, we just want to look at this little sermon from the thought operating from him power. Operating from him power. There are all different types of power that we deal with in the world today. We have some horsepower, which causes our car to perform better on the road. We have solar power, which causes us to be a little more energy efficient. We have nuclear power that all of the world is seeking to have so they don't get bullied by bigger powers. We have name power. Somebody is going through a struggle now because they dropped the name of their father for their own gain. And sometimes it's not what you know, but who you know. Name power means something. In this book, we have what we conclude each one of our services with, a benediction. And if you have any pastor worth his salt, he'll tell his members, don't leave on a benediction because you may miss your blessing. Jew, Jew, Jew writes this letter. And in the beginning, as he writes this letter in verse 3, he says, I just wanted to write about the commonality in faith, but I felt the need to shift the atmosphere of this letter. He needed to shift from just speaking about the commonality of the faith to warning the faithful members of this church of some ill-fated things that had been going on. Jude announces himself as the brother of James. Who is James? James is the brother of Jesus. That means that Jude is also the brother of Jesus. Isn't it strange that Jude declined to use Jude, the brother of Jesus? He didn't use that name power. He didn't flex his muscle. Because Jew understood where he came from. Jew was a part of that crowd in Matthew 12, 46, where it says his mother and brethren stood without as Jesus taught in the synagogue. 
And that word stood without literally means they didn't go into here. They stood on the wayside and they waited for Jesus to conclude. So much so to the point that the people in the synagogue said, your mother and brother are waiting for you. Jesus rebutted, who is my mother and my brethren? But them who do the work of my father. Jew remembers that he was part of that crowd in John 7, where they said, if you are who you say you are, won't you go up to Jerusalem? Jesus rebutted and said, it is not my time as of yet, because he knew that what was in their heart was not for him to proclaim himself at that time, but they wanted him to reveal himself to them so that they can have firm footing. But something happened between Jerusalem and Calvary for Jews. Something shifted in the atmosphere between Jerusalem and Calvary for Jews. For Jew was now compelled to contend for what he was contentious against. Jews shifted between Jerusalem and Calvary. He was now compelled to contend for the faith. Jew not did not announce the power of Jesus to this church, but he confirmed the power of Jesus to this church. Jew compelled himself to speak of the power that they were introduced to by Jesus himself. It was not his job to tell them about the power. It was not his job to introduce them to the power, but it was his job to remind them of the power. Jude had to remind them of what it is that they say they signed up for. Jude urges them to operate in that power, in that him power. And what is him power? Today, we got to have a couple elements in our life to understand what operating in him power looks like. The first component that we need is compassion. Jude tells us, for some, have compassion. We forget our faith walk very easily. We forget from where the Lord has brought us from. And when we look out on our brothers and sisters who may not have gotten to where they belong right now, we forget to have a little compassion. We forget that God saw fit to save us from our sins because of the compassion he had for us. We forget that God saw us in the worst of times, in the best of times in our sin, and he had a little compassion to bring us to where we are now. But it's our fault that we fail to have that same compassion for our brothers and sisters. God found us not praying. God found us not seeking his face. But God found us doing some foul things. God found us smelling funny. God found us looking crazy. God found us acting shameful. And God had compassion when he looked on our pitiful situation. And it is with that same compassion that we should be compelled to look at our brothers and sisters and say, honey, you're going to make it. It's our compassion that should go forth and say, look at where God has brought me from. It's a little compassion that we can say, I'm going to pray for that brother or sister to be delivered. It's just a little bit of compassion that you can spread and say, keep on keeping on. Because God gave us compassion when we didn't deserve it. So the first element that we need when we operate in him power is a little compassion. If it had not been for a little hug that a mother of the church gave us once upon a time ago, if it had not been for somebody praying for us when we were pitiful, if it had not been for somebody wrapping their arms around us when we were ready to fall, it just takes a little compassion sometimes. Reflection of Jesus is what our brothers and sisters ought to see in us when they see the compassion that we are compelled to give. But the second element that we need is a little steadfastness. Steadfastness. 
one of the easiest things to do in life is to quit. But the one thing that's worse than quitting is faking. It's easier to quit, and it is just as simple to fake it. Jew warns us to beware of some men that crept in unavailable. It was some brothers and sisters that crept into the church house who were not in the church house to seek God, but they were only in the church house to stir up confusion. They only took that pew each morning to murmur and complain about what was going on in the church house. They only came in the church house to stop you from seeking God's face. But it's our job to remain steadfast. Drew warns us to beware of those who claim the faith, but everything about that faith is contrary to what they claim. We need a little steadfastness to go against the murmurers and the complainers. It's easy to sit on the pew this morning and hear them say, it don't take all that. I wish he'd sit down. Stop talking about money. Where are we going after this? And it's our job to be steadfast in what we say to believe in and say, pay attention. Listen up. Buckle down. Close your eyes and say a little prayer if you can't focus. Because it's the steadfastness in the faith that will deliver you from the depths of hell. You can quit easily. It's easy to go outside and quit on the faith. It's easy to hear somebody talk down on the church and be discouraged on your faith journey. But I hasten somebody this morning to just have a little steadfastness to look towards the hills from which cometh your help. Because if God saved you with a little compassion, it is our duty to remain steadfast to what he has called us to. We ought to be his faithful witnesses when it gets hard. We ought to be the ones that stand when it gets hard. We ought to be the ones that speak when we shouldn't talk. We ought to be the ones that say the things that the world tells us to shut up about. We ought to be the ones that stand up when evil is all around us. We ought to be the ones that are steadfast in God's word. Because what God did for us is worth remaining steadfast towards. We need a little steadfastness. But not only do we need compassion and steadfastness, we need his forgiveness. We need his forgiveness. And I just want to tell somebody this morning that forgiveness is a two-way street. I think we get it a little mixed up when we think about what forgiveness actually is. Can I, can I make a, a contrast to that? Brother Aaron, him and I are good friends. I call him revenge. And if I walked up to Brother Aaron one day and I slapped him across the face and I said, forgive me, brother, he forgive me based off of our relationship. But if I came up to him the next day and did the same thing, I'm pretty sure, I'm sure for certain that he gonna reevaluate that relationship because my sorry didn't match my actions. My sorry wasn't a two-way street. My sorry was only consistent on me saying what I knew he wanted to hear to allow me another opportunity to just do it again. Forgiveness is a two-way street. And if we look at 1 John 1, 9, it tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that word confess in the Greek tells us that you are conceding to someone. You are agreeing with someone. And as we confess our sins to the Father, it is he who looks down and says, you are forgiven. It is not our sorry that forgives us. It is not us looking at God and saying he's going to forgive us and turn around and do the same thing. But it's a two-way street, us looking at the Father and agreeing that I'm dirt. It's a looking at the Father and agreeing that I'm a sinner. 
is looking at the father and agreeing that I fell short. And is looking at the father and telling him that I'm going to do better. And the father looks down on us. And he says, child of mine, you are forgiven. He looks down on us and says, child of mine, get on up. He says, child of mine, you are forgiven for the things that you've done. We need a little forgiveness. Confess our sins to the Father. That means we agree with his position that we are no good and need to be saved by grace. But that Greek word, homologeo, not only means to agree with, it not only means to concede, but it also means praise and celebration. And you can't have forgiveness if you aren't thankful and celebratory for what God has done for you. You can't look at God and say, thank you for forgiveness, and turn around and do the same thing. Just like my good Sunday school teacher just told me, who you with? Who you with? Because if you receive that forgiveness from the Father, you can't turn back around and do the same things you used to, but you celebrate for what God has done for you. You celebrate because I knew when I was down and out, I confessed my sins to the Father. He was faithful and just to forgive me of all unrighteousness. He cleansed me, y'all. You need a little forgiveness. But let's not hold you too long. Not only do you need a little steadfastness, not only do you need a little compassion, not only do you need his forgiveness, but you need him in your future. You need God in your future. God gave his promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. And Abraham couldn't pass his faith along to Isaac, but he left a faithful example for Isaac to mimic. Isaac couldn't take his faith and pass it on to Jacob, but he left a faithful image for Jacob to mimic. Jacob couldn't pass his faith on to Joseph, but he left a faithful image for Joseph to mimic. And this morning, I just want to say thank you, Lucille Green. Thank you, Pat Dixon, for the faithful image that you showed me. Thank you, Lawrence Chamberlain, for the faithful image you have showed me. Thank you, Willie Moore Sr., for the faith example you have left. Because without that faithful example, we wouldn't have the angel of this house. We need him in our future. But that's not the only thing I see about future preaching. That's not the only thing I see about him in our future. But I see the text saying, now unto him. And as the old funny man used to say, him got a name. And his name is Jesus. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's David's redeemer. He's Mary's baby boy. What does the Bible say about his future? The Bible tells us in Mark 16, 9, after he had said these things, he was taken up into heaven where he seated on the right hand of the Father. John 14, 2 tells us, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would not have told you so. Revelation 3 and 21 says that him that overcometh, I will give him a seat on the throne. And just like I have overcome, and I sit on my father's throne, and what did he overcome? He overcame mean men, spitting on him, beating him all night long. Not because he did anything wrong, because he had compassion for my sins. He was steadfast to the cross. He marched up Calvary's rugged hills. He carried a cross on his shoulders. Not because he had did wrong, but because he looked down on you and he looked down on me and he said sons and daughters you are forgiven but forgiveness doesn't happen without the shedding of blood so he went up on that cross he bowed his head for me he died for you he died we had a celebration down in hell where he took the keys of death from the devil snatched them right out of his hands he said my people I come that you might have life and you might have more abundantly. He died 
Didn't he die? He went down into a borrowed grave. Joseph had to have it back because one day it was going to be his permanent resting place. But Jesus just needed it for a little while. But early, I said early, on the third day, he got up. Not with just some power, not with just any power, but with that him power, that him power to pick us up, that him power to turn us around, that him power to set us straight, that him power to prop us up when we're leaning over, that him power to tell us that when it's dark, I will be a light unto your feet and a lamp unto your pathway. Do you know him? His name is Jesus. He's beckoning us to operate in his power, not in our own power. Power. Not in this world's power, but in his power. Hey, hey! <laughs> Operating in him power. It's easy to operate in a lot of other power. But God is calling us today yeah. that if you have been saved from your sins, yes, if you look at God and say, I agree that I am nothing, yeah. but you have forgiven me for all that I have ever done, yes, he's beckoning us to operate in his power. Yes, and as we stand today, yes, there may be one who is not familiar with that power. And it is my, not, not my job to introduce you to that power, but to bring into remembrance what Jesus did for us. Will there be one looking for a little operational him power? When you operate in his power, you don't have to worry about sickness. You don't have to worry about trials and tribulations because they are going to come. But his power will help you overcome. His power will bring you into his future. Now unto him, he will keep you from falling. He will present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Won't you come? God bless you. Amen. Amen and amen. What a what a mighty word. What a mighty word. What a, him power. Under him that is able. Him. Amen. Unto him, him, power that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Amen. Thank you, Minister Chris, for allowing the Lord to use you to the glory of God. It's tithing and giving time. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise him. Amen. Amen. Amen.
right right before oh okay amen 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 it is tithing and giving time and 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 as i alluded to earlier that we want to celebrate reverend moore it is his birthday so so th this is this is this is how we're going to do it this is how we're going to do it now now listen now listen to me we're going to get uh pat dixon you're going to hold this back this is going to be the basket for tithes and offering that's going to be in the middle amen then we're going to ask uh let's see Brittany to shay ray can you come and hold one basket? And we're going to ask Kanisha to hold another basket. And they get the big baskets. All right. So one on one side. And then Pat, you're going to be in the middle. And so the baskets on the end are going to be for Reverend Moore that we want to celebrate him and show him our appreciation for his birthday. So the baskets on the end are for Reverend Moore. And if you are at home on easy, on, on, online, you can go to Easy Ties in the drop down. You will see a, a category for Pastor Moore's birthday. So we're going to celebrate his birthday. It is Tuesday and we're going to celebrate him in advance. Amen. 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 All right. Back in your hands. Hey, amen. Thank you so very much. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Simpson. Uh, hey, thank you for taking it from me. <laughs> amen. I was, about to, I was about to say, I got this. <laughs> I said I was about to say that. Because I did, I did have one, one announcement. Uh, uh, Minister Tiffany is going to be preaching at 3, 3 o'clock. 3.30 at the uh, Mount Carmel Baptist Church at 58th and Race for... Uh, for women in white eastern region women in white and so and if you're not done with church after we leave north philly we'll come back to west philadelphia amen, amen. it's tidying and giving time amen i like the way y'all say that y'all have learned to get the decibels up and let me just inform you for the last few weeks you know what we've made budget so I, I, what I need you to do is keep it up now. Keep it up. Keep it up. Somebody said don't, don't announce it because they'll, you know, they'll go back. Amen. But I, but I, but I, I ain't like that. I ain't like that. I, I want you to know y'all made, y'all made budget and we want to keep making budget. Hey, oh, praise his holy name. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so we're going to ask those in the balcony to come first. And you can see the, uh, uh, QR code on the on the screen. Amen. If you have not already given online. All right, those persons in the balcony. Amen. Y'all act like y'all know now. Devon Devante. Amen. Even even if you're not giving, even if you're not giving, and if you're not holding the baby, you need, you need to walk so folk don't think I'm just up here talking. Amen. Because if you're doing a whole lot of talking and ain't nobody following you, you just took a walk. Y'all make me look like the leader. Amen. Those, those to my right, would you stand facing the walls at the direction of our ushers? to my right, would you stand?
all things come of thee, O Lord. Amen. And uh, at, after the benediction, we're going right over to Love Zion uh, Baptist Church, and that's 25 what? Amen. It's on the screen. 2521 North 23rd Street. Amen. At this time, we'll have the closing remarks and benediction by Minister Dixon. Yes, We're going to say it this time, and, and hopefully it has a little more meaning to us. Uh, yeah. And now unto him yes, who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only one wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. May God's people say. Go in peace and serve the Lord.